Hi, I'm Rami Tamimi, and this is a GNSS receiver. Today, we're going to cover how a GNSS receiver finds its position on Earth. If this is something that interests you, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel as I'll be releasing several videos talking about GPS and GNSS receivers. Now let's talk about what a GNSS receiver is. This cell phone has a GNSS receiver. The GPS navigation in your car has a GNSS receiver. And this surveying device has a GNSS receiver. All of these devices have GNSS receivers in them to help them find their location using satellites. The satellites that are orbiting Earth are sending out signals that are being received by these receivers, hence the name. This will allow them to calculate their position here on Earth in relation to the satellites. The way that this works is that satellites will start to transmit their position in real time. The receiver here on Earth is looking for a signal from the satellite, and by the time it receives that signal, the time will have changed. So for example, let's say the signal of the satellite was transmitted at nine o'clock and zero seconds, and at the receiving end, we received that signal at 9 o'clock and 1 second, then the time difference that it took for the satellite signal to reach Earth was 1 second. By knowing at what time the signal was sent out and at what time it was received, a GNSS receiver is able to take the difference between the two and find the time it took to receive the signal. By taking the time that it took to receive the signal and multiplying it by the speed of light, we're able to calculate what the distance is from the satellite to the receiver. This process is known as trilateration. So here is what trilateration is. Trilateration incorporates the idea that the time that it takes to receive a signal from a satellite multiplied by the speed of light will equal the distance. And what does that mean? Like how can we put this into like a diagram? Now let's say this right here is Earth, okay? And imagine this is a sphere. And the first satellite we have, let's say is here, okay? The satellite signal might be something like this. Now again, imagine this is a sphere and being a sphere, the solution is, there's really no solution. Like it could be anywhere. That's the amount of time that it takes to hit the Earth could be in multiple places at the same time. But then let's say we've got another satellite over here and so this satellite hits the earth at a particular time this area right here this is a circle and again so there's a huge amount of solution that could be there it's not really giving us uh, a real solution now what ends up happening when we add a third satellite let's draw our little satellite right here and let me draw this in a different angle the satellites are now in three different locations uh, again imagine them as spheres this this location in the real world is actually down on Earth and up in the sky. So we know where the location is. It's obviously the location on the ground, not the location that's up in the sky. Theory is great, but in reality, that's just not enough satellites for an accurate reading. And in order to do this in practice, you're going to need a minimum of four satellites. The more satellites that we have, the higher our positional accuracy will be for our receiver. Now let's talk about the three segments needed in order to achieve an observation. The space segment, the control segment, and the user segment. The space segments are the satellites that are up in the air. All these satellites are orbiting about 13,000 miles above Earth's surface. And all these satellites are up in the air orbiting Earth, and their job is to help us find the location of our GNSS-enabled devices here on the ground. Okay, now I know by now you're probably wondering, why do I keep referring to these GPS units as GNSS receivers? What's the difference between GNSS and GPS, Global Positioning System, or GPS. These are the American satellites. There are also Russian satellites, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Russian satellite name, but it's more commonly known as GLONASS. Third is the European satellite system, which is known as Galileo, which is named after the great Italian astronomer Galileo, also being referred to as the father of observational astronomy. And finally, there's the Chinese satellite system, which is known as BIDO. This is in reference to the Great Dipper and the North Star in the sky. Collectively, all of these satellites are under the Global Navigation Satellite System, or as it's more commonly referred to as GNSS. So now understand that when I say GNSS receiver, I'm talking about receivers that can observe all the satellites in the sky. 
The second system is known as the control segment. These internal orbital modules are known as the ephemerates. They take care of the health and calibration of the satellites in the sky. This segment is here on Earth and is found in a stationary location. The control element of this segment is used to correct any errors that come from the satellites. And the more satellites that we're able to observe in our control segment, the more likely we are to find an error and correct it, therefore increasing our accuracy at the user segment. A good example for the control segment is a base station. By setting up a receiver in a stationary location, it will continuously collect data from the satellite and any changes or discrepancies in the readings can then be corrected and transferred over to the user segment. Now there are long-term reference systems that are set up um, and they can be accessed by the public and that way you don't need to have two receivers. Having the base and the rover uh, together, you know, it's just more equipment, more cost. So you could just take the rover receiver, connect it to uh, some kind of reference frame, and that would be your control segment in order to complete the solution. Usually these are found in very populated areas, anywhere that's more rural or not really connected to society. You're not gonna have these reference frames. So you're going to need two receivers, a base, and a rover in order to complete all three segments. And finally, the user segment. This includes this thing, and this thing, and anything that has a GNSS receiver inside of it. The user segment is the end result. It's what we're trying to measure. It's the location that we're trying to find. And the other two segments are just a means of helping us achieve a more accurate position for our user segment. Now, as surveyors, it's our job to take measurements accurately. Whether that is a relative measurement between two points, like we do with total stations and levels, or if it's absolute measurements with satellite positioning as we try to find the location of a point in a certain datum or coordinate system. Regardless of what you're doing, your job as a surveyor is to ensure that all the data you collect is accurate and any elements of corrections that are being used should be fully understood. In the next several videos, I'll show you how to use this equipment and setting it up in various ways in order to collect data accurately. We'll also talk about how GNSS receivers are relative to surveying and I'll be showing you tips and tricks to help optimize your work using this equipment. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to like the video, I'd really appreciate it. Also be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on the bell notification so you can be the first to be notified of when I release new content regarding GNSS receivers. Also be sure to join our Facebook group, the link is in the description. We've got surveyors from all over the world. All my social media and contact information is in the description. If you want to know more about these two inlet receivers, check out the link in the description. And with that, I'll see you guys next time.